Hello, good evening and welcome to Gendered Powers, the first uh, tonight of a series of conversations. Uh, tonight we are uh, taking on the question, looking the part, history's power to change the view. I'm Wes Williams, I'm the director of TORCH, the Oxford Research Centre for the Humanities, and it's my honour and privilege to really just introduce today's session, uh, hand over to the speakers and then return at the end to help moderate the questions. So please do, as uh, the discussion develops, please do put questions into the, uh, the chat function um, and we'll pick them up and uh, try and uh, get as many of them uh, thought about in the last section of today's discussion. Today's uh, speakers, people involved in this uh, conversation. First of all, it's a great honor to have Professor Brenda Stevenson, currently Nickel Family Endowed Professor of History at UCLA and from 2021, later this year, she will take up her post as the Hillary Rodham Clinton Professor of Women's History at Oxford, the first such holder of this chair and an indicator of how Oxford is now finally, after all this time, beginning to take women's history just that bit more seriously. And in a sense, that's what these conversations are about. A series of conversations, in some sense, celebrating the 100 years since uh, women were uh, permitted if we put it like that, uh, to take their degrees here at Oxford, but also critiquing the history of women at Oxford and women in universities beyond. We also have with us Dr. Mishka Sinha, a research associate and co-director of the St. John's College Colonial Past Project. And then moderating the discussion today, and really the person who brought this series of conversations uh, into being, Professor Jane Garnett, fellow in history at Wadham College and academic lead for equality and diversity in the humanities division. This series of conversations is brought to you in association with Wadham College and with the Women in Humanities uh, program at Torch and the Humanities Cultural Program. I see Jane is now on screen with us and I'll hand over to you, Jane, and uh, disappear from the screens um, until the questions emerge towards the end. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wes. Um, it's, it's a real privilege and pleasure to be um, introducing this event. Um, so I just want to say a few words to contextualise our conversation um, and to, in a way, riff off the, the image that you've just been looking at on the screen. So at the start of Dorothy Sayers' novel, Gaudy Night, which was published in 1935, academic dress is presented as a metaphor for the challenges for women of taking their rightful place in the university's power structure. Towards the end of the alumni summer reunion, the Gordy of the title, the Dean of the fictional Shrewsbury College in Oxford exclaims, now we can get rid of the filthy old bombazine and show off our party frocks. Why did we ever clamor for degrees and the fun of stewing in academicals on a hot day? It was much more difficult to wear attractive and distinctive women's dress under a gown and hood designed to be worn with male clothing. It took careful thought and it was easy to get it wrong. Meanwhile, a few lines further on, the Dean refers to the careless way in which the new generation of undergraduates were treating their gowns, simply following male undergraduates in taking them for granted scrunching them up and using them as dusters. Sayers had been at Somerville, which is loosely the model for Shrewsbury College, from 1912 to 1915, and had been one of the first women formally to graduate in 1920. As Wes said, this evening's event is the first in a series of critical conversations around gender and power related to the centenary of women being awarded degrees in Oxford. This uh, move in 1920 was a rather belated one. Women had been studying for degrees since the late 1870s, and it was very much on men's terms. Oxford was ahead of Cambridge, which only awarded degrees to women after the Second World War, but behind other universities in the country. As the governing elites of the two universities most tied not just to the intellectual, but the political establishment, the fears of male Oxbridge about their loss of monopolistic power 
had both caused the delay in the first place and informed the restricted way in which the change was introduced. And if you're interested, um, William White, who was also involved with me in, in thinking about this series, um, and I wrote a little piece um, which is up on the Oxford Making History website. Um, and we note there, for example, that, that after Oxford's move, Cambridge indeed tried to cream off male candidates by representing Oxford as having become socialistic, weak in athletics and bewomaned, which led Oxford defensively in 1927 to introduce a quota of women students, which wasn't lifted for totally until 1957. So as the 1915 American anti-suffrage postcard, which is, forms part of the poster for this event, um, shrieked in alarm, what will men wear if women wear the trousers? So to what extent did conventions of power in fact remain in place? How difficult did it remain, and indeed has it remained, for women to, quote, look the part, to play the part, and most importantly, to create and introduce new parts. As one Oxford woman academic observed in 1920, the formal admission of women to membership of the university was really only the start. A new habit of mind had to be formed. And this was arguably necessary, not just to enable parity of esteem, but to create the scope and confidence to reconceive long held assumptions and to open up questions which might lead to real change. The cultivation of new habits of mind remains a challenge within institutions of all sorts. This is where history can help us to change the view. Thinking historically means developing an imaginative engagement with the past, which recognizes differences as well as affinities and disrupts linear teleologies exposing assumptions about norms of authority and self-presentation. Disciplinary developments have their own histories, which have themselves been gendered and racialized and normatized in a variety of ways. And these processes have, have of course affected both diversity of representation in the academy and also intellectual emphases as a whole. So I now want to invite um, Brenda and Mishka to um, come on screen to talk about these questions with me um, from um, these different angles. I hope they're about to appear. Hi. Hello. Great to see you. Great. So Brenda, can we start perhaps with, with you? It's lovely to see you here um, uh, nice in virtual space uh, all the way from California. Um, <laughs> Brenda, perhaps you might say something about how you understand the critical role of women's history in opening up new um, perspectives on history as a whole and how, can, how in, indeed one can underline the capacity, its capacity to change the view, if you like, to change the view for everyone. Well, you know, that's an interesting question. It's often, and, and sometimes I get this question and I think, how could we think about the world without thinking about the roles of women in the world? Since we are literally one half of the world in terms of population. And, um, and we're not just sort of sitting someplace in a box and not moving and not affecting or impacting the world around us. Um, and so, um, you know, it's an incredible opening up of the world's imagination and um, our view into the reality of how the world works to know what part women play, what part we have played, you know, from the very beginning until now. And it's so interesting to me, too, because if you look at the Judaic Christian, um, I guess, um, and many other kinds of stories about our creation, women are right there from the very beginning and, um, and causing trouble and, you know, mixing it all up and causing alternative narratives um, to take place and, and all of that. Um, and so it's interesting that from, you know, we have this kind of past 
mythologically or philosophically and certainly in terms of our belief systems. But then it kind of disappears when we look at organized educational pursuits and where women are located in that, either in terms of those persons who lives and experiences and contributions um, and evils um, have been hidden or not spoken to, and of those people who have actively, because um, how can we not be active in, in creating the world around us? So I think uh, women's history is particularly uh, important because it has been uh, made invisible um, it had to be made invisible because we were always here and we were always doing things um, and we were always a part of it. So we're pulling back the veil. Power, yeah. Right, exactly. And, um, and having power, not necessarily power in the ways in which males exercise power, but sometimes that way too. So uh, women's history is actually unveiling what had to be veiled. Thank you. I mean, you've obviously worked on on a wide range of of women and women's histories from a, over over a period, you know, a long long chronological period. I mean, do you see a real difference between your, I suppose, the sort of dialogues you were having to open up in relation to the work you've done on the nineteenth century and the work you've done in the more recent past? And, um, uh, do you mean in terms of the members of people who are involved in those pursuits or actually well, I the, suppose the sort of the sort of move you've had to make in order to, you know, uh, I suppose, open up, uh, you know, convince the skeptics, open up persuasion? You know? Yes, no, most definitely, particularly with my 20th century book, because I was on actually a talk with um, someone at Oxford yesterday. And, um, and the question was whether or not my 20th century book was, you know, what modern history and the problems associated with modern history and people sort of seeing it or feeling it as it's journalistic versus being historical um, in a way. And so every, I think, move that we make is questioned to a certain extent, mm -hmm. uh, particularly if that move is associated associated with women's history. You know, um, the whole question of whether the validity of women's history is still somewhere dancing in the background of many scholars' imaginations and the public as well. Um, for example, when I was working on um, slavery, um, the, the big thing then was to talk about women in slavery because indeed when even with the revision of scholars of the 1970s and 1980s up until you know Deborah White in 1984 no one had thought that women's experiences or had written about women's experiences being different from those of men um, and so you know when I talk about the 20th century it's sort of the same kind of thing um, even when you talk about the civil rights movement people just assume you know that you have these certain male characters and you have these female characters that you know go along with them um, that are there in the background that type the memos that make the reservations um, etc and so you know stopping to think no there's actually women who are you know policy makers there are women who are strategists there are women who are putting their lives on the line and then you always have this question of well you work on people of color in particular. So when you talk about women, are you detracting from the focus on this group of people who have been, you know, silenced and have been made invisible too? Are you, you know, deciding that women's history is more important than African American history or that it's more important than, you know, um, history and, you know, the history of these groups that have been left out um, to begin with. So that has been a real challenge. And looking at the ways in which women have been oppressed within minority groups is also a challenge because, you know, the party line had been for many, many generations of scholars is that we are an oppressed group and we need to deal with that oppression as a group. But within our group, we cannot talk about the kinds of things that are oppressive. We cannot talk about the kinds of things that have harmed people from within the group. And so, of course, notions of misogyny within the African American community, for example, um, um, ideas about colorism, et cetera, were all kind of shh, you know, um, for long periods 
periods of time um, and abuse, et cetera. So there's been a lot of challenges with regard to investing in women's history, um, either if you are doing an older period of time or um, certainly a more recent period of time, the kinds of questions that you get, the kinds of intellectual surveillance um, that you get is, is quite acute. And not only from the outside, that is um, people who don't do what you do, um, but also um, sometimes um, from the inside, and I've spoken about African American scholars or um, audience saying, "Don't uncover the um, the some of the less uh, laudatory aspects of our of our culture and our, of our history." But also, women's historians saying, "Are you detracting from um, you know the process of uh, liberating women when you talk about women of color specifically?" or you talk about a different group of women and you explore the ways in which women have not cooperated with one another or, or you know, or um, supported women, one another mm -hmm. across history and time. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that difficulty or that challenge has gone up and down, hasn't it, in relation to contemporary politics, I mean, and culture wars and identity in a oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. And, you know, it's you just sort of stepping in and out of minefields sometime. Um, sometimes you land in a very sweet spot and sometimes you learn, land in a very sticky um, and heated spot. So, you You've know. talked a lot about how, of course, somehow how difficult it is for people to see, um, for example, gender and race as, as you know, intersecting in complex ways. I mean, they, they want to see one or the other, as it were. I mean, it's, it's quite absolutely. striking, isn't it? No, absolutely. And then, you know, and the other kinds of social variables like class and, mm -hmm. you know, rural versus urban, um, and of course, generation, religion of certainly, certainly, absolutely, um, you know, Black Americans versus Black British um, or Caribbean or African, you know, all of these, um, these things are, are intersect to colonial versus slavery, enslavement, you know, um, they all make a difference. Mm. Um, they all, um, in some ways, are connected, but they're also se separate and disparate. Mm. Um, and so you're likely to get raise the ire of one group or one intersections that's different from the next intersection um, mm. as you as you make your way uh, into the archive and then into the press mm. or into the classroom. Mm. Mishka, can I bring you in, in there um, partly to um, talk about your own historical expertise on disciplinary histories, but partly also to connect with you know, some of the things that Brenda's just been talking about. I mean, can you say something about, I mean, you've particularly worked on the history of the field, which is rather quaintly still called Oriental Studies. Um, uh, could you say something about the way in which the process of professionalization and institutionalization since the late 19th century has either enabled or resisted new points of view in your sort of um, intellectual area and I suppose how have gender and ethnic diversity played into that and and I suppose as a sort of coda to that I mean I wondered whether you could think a little bit about how that's entering that field is, has felt different for you perhaps as somebody of a younger generation you know scholarship um, um, thank you. Um, that's a very complex set of questions, but I'll, I'll try. Um, I'll try to to respond. Um, so, um, so the, I suppose the the point that I begin with is is to is to start by saying that the that the the university as we understand it today, the modern university, is 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 a very new thing. Um, I, it's almost as new as women being in the university. It's almost as new. As having a diverse university because what we're talking about is the research university and that doesn't come about um, really till the 19th century and in Oxford uh, particularly doesn't come about till late in the 19th century um, because until you know until sort of the 19th century Oxford is basically a, a place for tra training religious men to, to enter you know or, or a very small confined set of of um, of of 
well, I wouldn't call them necessarily professions, but fields. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that, and disciplines start to come in at around the same time, disciplines as we understand them, um, really start to come in the 19th century. And that's true in, in, the, in, in Britain, it's also true in, in, in continental Europe, and it's true in, in the United States, that he starts having the move towards the modern university. And so I think that it's important to remember that when we talk about um, that, that, that diversity in the university is, is almost, almost um, there, ab initio, ab, ab ovo, right from the beginning. Um, and I think that that's, so, that, so that's the first thing I would say. In terms of the disciplines, so, and in the discipline that I've looked at, Oriental Studies, and particularly I look at the history of Sanskrit, um, comes about at this particular moment as the modern university, as we experience it today, is coming into being. A research university which has postgraduate students, um, where, um, where, where faculty has time for research, um, where you know it's teaching and research go together, um, and I would say that with Oriental studies in particular, it brings in different kinds of diversities. It helps bring in different kinds of diversities that I have come to associate with this idea of modernity in the university. Um, and so, I mean, I was talking earlier to to, to Eugene and uh, to Brenda about um, Caroline Mary Ridding, who's one of the women that I've looked at. Um, and she, and her, her case is, is quite instructive and it might be a kind of way of illustrating the kind of thing I'm trying to say. So Ridding um, was uh, at Cambridge. She was at Girton, which is one of the first women's colleges. Um, and she decided to study Sanskrit, um, but she couldn't get um, she couldn't get her degree until much later in the 20th century um, at Cambridge. But she then became she, she so she, so one of the things that's interesting about her is that she had to earn her own living. So and this is one of the things that you get again in the 19th century that you have as opposed to the Orientalists, the idea of Orientalism as something that's amateur that's pursued by colonial administrators or wealthy explorers or other people in their spare time or, or travel writers, it is a profession. It becomes, starts to become a profession and it's a profession that women want to enter and, um, and can enter from a certain point. And so Ridding becomes one of these women, but of course, once she enters it, there are no jobs. Anyway, Oriental Studies being a not, you know, not particularly a big discipline has never had many jobs. Um, there are a few jobs in, in empire um, and there are a few jobs at, at, at universities in the UK, but very few. So what does she do? <clears throat> and she ends up first trying private tuitions and then she ends up working for the, for the university library. She's one of the first women to work for the university library in Cambridge. Um, and what she does there, the kinds of things, the work she does, I think are particularly illustrative to me of just how the road of women and, if you like, marginal or marginalized people within the university um, contributed to opening the university up in so many different ways and to opening disciplines and pushing disciplines and languages in the university that otherwise might have remained much more narrow. So reading catalogues, she, she prepares a catalogue um, of Sanskrit texts in the university library that's hugely important because it's one of those things that's, that people don't want to do. It's badly paid, but it's groundwork for big scholars who come next. Um, the other things she does is she she has she starts to study other languages and she studies unpopular languages. So she's got her Sanskrit, which is seen as an almost almost an equivalent of a classical language. Um, because what you get in the 19th century, I can talk about this later, I don't want to go on for too long, but there's a hierarchy of languages. And of course, classical languages are at the top. Um, and then you have all these new disciplines, which, and particularly at Oxford, where um, what was called the greats, classics, is at the heart of the curriculum. And then you have these other disciplines coming in and vying to enter. Um, and what, what people like Ridding and other women um, do is as they enter, they, they start to take up spaces that aren't taken. So doing these obscure, not so well-known languages. And that is why you get in the early 20th century, women at the forefront of many of the new Oriental languages or non-European languages. Um, and reading one of her reading specialties is Tibetan, and she's asked to translate the the, the manuscripts that are stolen <laughs> from Central Asia by Oral Stein, um, 
uh, the explorer um, and there are and, she, and there are apparently about two people in in the in britain who can translate these and caroline mary reading is one of them so she sent these manuscripts and so she's vital to making this material then available to a whole bunch of scholars and i'll just end by saying that reading is one person but we also have um the first um the first professor of what were known as bantu languages in Ox in in the in the united kingdom was a woman a woman called alice werner um, who starts off basically teaching in her in kind of as as a, as private tuition, and then she gets affiliated to um, to King's College London, and then she she gets a professorship at at, at SOAS because nobody else at that point these are not considered prestigious languages. So yeah, that's so interesting. But meanwhile, I mean, um, I guess the the for the um, the association of Sanskrit with the imperial project of course means that there's a resistance to giving even better qualified women jobs you were mentioning some a, a german scholar who uh, even in the mid 20th century is is excluded a woman excluded because um, actually there's still this legacy of association of of uh, i suppose you know male imperial service with with the study of sanskrit is that right Yes, I mean, I, I think that one of the things, and this is part of, again, this is again, you see a part that this, this particular case, uh, the case of Betty Hyman, is playing in this larger um, move of the university towards, towards modernity, because one of the things that's happening at Oxford and at British universities is they're resisting the change. There's a huge, um, there's, a, there's a great deal of unease about what they see as a kind of German innovation. Um, and there's this this conversation that is, is, is recorded at Hansard, which is the parliament, parliament um, the records of parliament, and uh, the parliamentary debates, um, wh wh where they talk about how they don't want Oxford to become a second rate German lyceum. Um, so they're resisting this idea of research and, and opening things up. And, um, and what, and, 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 but you find that this is not the case everywhere, but Oxford is one of the kind of last bastions of trying to preserve what they see as a particular kind of, education you know that's that's grounded here um and the Bowdoin professorship which is the professorship of sanskrit at oxford which was founded um in 1832 but actually create um the the the, the sort of the, the seeds for it exists from 1811 um they're founded you know it is founded by an, an ex uh, uh a, a east india uh company and sort of army person called joseph Burden, um, who, who wants to do it in order to, to further the cause of Christianity in India. Um, other universities, as they, because in the 19th century, have other professorships of Sanskrit founded, um, they have scholars from all over um, the world, including, you know, and, and not just Sanskrit, but in Oriental languages, you have people coming in. Uh, well, first of all, you have more women, particularly in places like, um, so UCL is, is a fantastic example. They, they take in you know, people of different religious faiths, um, women and 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 other kinds of uh, groups. Oxford is very resistant. Oxford and Cambridge, of course, don't allow anyone who's not um, Anglican um, to 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 first to to get a degree. That's from the eighteen fifties to get an undergraduate degree, and then until late in the nineteenth century to actually become uh, to become a fellow. Um, but what you get in the 1940s is the remnants of these these conditions and the burden professorship continues to resist um well anybody who's not english um and I, as far as i know the current professor the burden professor chris christopher minkowski is the first that i burden professor that i know of who's not actually english he's still a man um as far as i know he's still white but he's not english the, the case I was talking to you about is the case of a German woman. She was German Jewish um, scholar of Indian philosophy at Halle. She had a professorship at Halle. Um, but when um, the National Socialist regime came to power, they divested her, they took away her professorship. And she came to Britain and she was desperately trying to, to, have a, to get a job. I and mean, this is a highly qualified woman. They gave her a job at uh, SOAS, which was only partially, fun, partially paid for. So she was really struggling and she applied for the Bowdoin professorship, which was, I think, became vacant in 19, uh, it was 1938 or 1942. It was 1938, uh, I think. And there were four people who applied for this. Um, three were men, one was a woman, Betty Hyman, um, Jewish woman, 
Um, and the two men uh, were both, I think, of South Asian origin. Um, and the person who got it was the only Englishman who applied, E. Johnston. Um, and he was professionally far less qualified than Betty Hyman, who was a professor and had, you know, uh, had professional qualifications. E. Johnston learned his Sanskrit in India, um, mostly, and a little bit of study at Oxford. But this is the kind of resistance that you continue to have. Um, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, you know, in and I think what's interesting about that is very, it's very hard to tell whether Betty Hyman um, didn't get the job. I mean, she clearly didn't not get the job because she wasn't the most qualified person, but she whether she didn't get the job because she was Jewish or a woman. Um, a lot of possibility. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and in a way, I mean, all that you're saying disrupts, you know, one particular narrative, which is that, you know, there is a sort of straight line of development of you know institution you know the institution as a professional body and you know operating according to some sort of set of norms you know which which do put you know merit ahead of everything else and do actually advance subjects in in a you know orderly sort of fashion as it were and of course you know all that you've said I mean shows how how you know uh, that things don't work like that I mean and you know in a sense as historians we all know don't we that that um, you know, uh, applying a different lens and asking different questions produces different, you know, different answers. And uh, I guess you know that's always happening, isn't it? And and of course, you know, institutions again uh, often are frightened of of change. They're frightened of new questions. You know, subject areas are, are often frightened of new of new questions. You know, so that's that's part of the context, isn't it? Um, I think. Sorry, if I may just say something back to that, which is that I don't think it's just that. Um, I mean, yes, absolutely, they're frightened of new questions, but I think they're also, there's also an economic aspect to this. Um, subjects want to preserve um, the, their ability to, to have, um, to, to, to the, their students who graduate to get jobs. Mm. So there's also competition and also subjects within new disciplines within, university, within a university, as we all know, have to compete for university funding. Mm. And so there's an there's an economic aspect to this as well that that I think can't be forgotten um, and has to be taken into account when you talk about all of these people who are um, vying for livelihoods. Mm. No, I think that's right. And there are gendered assumptions that play into that as well as you know other sorts of intersectional assumptions, aren't there? I mean, thinking thinking as we bring this our part of the conversation, you know, before we bring in the the wider um, audience. I mean, obviously, historical understanding demands that we think comparatively, we think self-reflexively, um, and that we're aware of, of a whole lot of variables of, of context, of generation, of identity position. Um, what I mean, what do you both think are the, are the chief, um, I suppose, opportunities and points of ongoing resistance, I suppose, in this respect in the academy today? I mean, um, whether they're um, perhaps continued um, uh, themes or, or indeed new, you know, uh, new opportunities, new resistances. Um, how do you see? Well, I think that first of all, the university is a reflection of the societies, you know, and so when we think of universities, we, we were just talking about meritocracy, for example, uh, we often think of the university as being a utopian location as the site of utopia where you know meritocracy wins out no matter what um and the public thinks of that and so that um when we have a public that feels as if women are not um intellectually superior as if women's studies is something that is you know posh or you know marginal and why should we be paying for it as taxpayers and that kind of thing that gets you know filtered into the university in one way or another part of it has to do with legislators trying to um, justify how much money is spent, how much tax income is spent on the university and various um, programs um, and that kind of thing. And so, I mean, even in, particularly in the United States, for example, 
a lot of angst is has been associated with interdisciplinarity, with multiculturalism, with intersectionality, um, um, et cetera. And so even the call in the last administration to not fund any of these programs, to not fund you know, um, ethnic studies, et cetera. And of course, there have been also always resistance to funding women's history to funding you know professorships in women's history and um that is also associated i think with the other things that we think of when we think of the academy publications what journals will publish what you know top university presses will publish um those kinds of things so we continue to have a little bit of pushback with regard to um, all kinds of topics that embrace women's history and gender uh, history, uh, not only from within the university, but also from with outside of the universal external to it from governmental entities to you know the common taxpayer to the presses themselves, um, the bookshops, even the ones online, um, etc. Yeah, I mean, of course, and that's, I mean, that ties in with what Mishka was saying about the, the sort of invention of the modern university in the 19th century, because I mean, certainly in Oxford, and more broadly, um, uh, you know, the whole idea of a liberal education was invented then. I mean, the idea of an education which, which was broad and uh, mm -hmm. cultivated the mind, if you like. Um, and I suppose that, you know, was contested at the time on the grounds of, of utility. I mean, was, was a liberal education a useful education? But of course, you know, as, as John Henry Newman said, you know, it wouldn't be the liberal education wouldn't be a good education if it wasn't actually useful as well. You know, so that notion of what's useful and what's good for society is, of course, absolutely, as you say, Brenda, I mean, at the heart of this, isn't it? You know, and, and that brings out contestations of, you know, what what society does need, if you like. Well, I think an interesting question and I thought of uh, is that in the United States, because of, se of, of apartheid, because of racial segregation, there are whole systems of colleges and universities that come into being, you know, after the Civil War in the 1860s. You know, it's the same time that women are being allowed to at least attend lectures in male colleges and that kind of thing. And but these colleges uh, that are established, the historical black uh, colleges and universities, are from the very beginning, um, most of them. Um, have both male and females um, involved, but this whole um, this whole question of you know what is what is an education for black people? It had to be. It was a question of utilitarianism. How mm -hmm. can we find employment? How can we take this group of people who have been so oppressed and give them some skills where they can find employment in the industrializing, you know, U.S. Um, but there was a big fight between, for example, Booker T. Washington and W. B. Du Bois about whether or not um, this uh, liberal arts education and the liberal arts education was um, really um, what was thought of as being a supreme um, education at Harvard, at Yale, at Princeton, you know, um, at all the, uh, the, the Ivy League, um, and, um, and also at the Seven Sisters and the other women's elite white women's colleges that had been established in the 1860s. So it's a, it's a somewhat of a different narrative um, because of this huge new population that comes into play um, in the U.S. that now has rights, et cetera, but, but are not going to be allowed to go to Harvard, Yale, Princeton. I mean, a few people are able to filter in, certainly not um, women um, either. So in the U.K., is there a similar system of colleges that were established um, as you began to, you know, in terms of the, the empire and people my immigrants coming in and wanting to be needing to be educated is there are there a system a similar system of colleges that are erected particularly for those populations it, no, it's slightly different i mean there are, there are civic universities in the 19th century that that are that are established to to cater to a local constituency which is which is a slightly different and broader constituency than people who are coming to oxford and cambridge but um, but that's still very much within you know uh, a, a, an English you know population I suppose um, I mean you do have some people um, from the empire coming into universities in the late 
19th century, mid to late 19th century, um, but it's a pretty small number. And in fact, it's a pretty small number of the amount of the population that are going to university at all um, at that sort of time. Um, so, you know, one's, one's still talking of a class, right. a class distinction. Um, and that's something which, you know, we still wrestle with, you know, to actually the, the whole issue of opening up um, universities uh, to, 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 to seem useful and central and um, possible, if you like, um, both financially, culturally, to, you know, our very diverse population and, and to people coming from other, other cultures. Uh, I mean, Mishka, would you want to add something to that? Um, yes, I, I would say that, well, also the, the difference is that the people who are coming um, in the 19th century from um, Asia and Africa uh, are not expected to stay. Uh, they're expected to come and study and, and leave. Um, uh, On the whole, they're quite privileged yeah. people. Yeah. So they're, and they're usually very wealthy in order to be, because um, also they, they can't, you know, so there's no system of prolonged, I mean, you can't, they can't do exams there, you know, they'd have to come here. Um, and, and they'd have to be able to afford to come. Um, so yes, they'd have to be wealthy, privileged people in the, in the 19th century. Um, in terms of the, the in terms of sort of later on the immigrants, I mean, yes, as, as Jane said, I, I mean, I don't, that's not my, my, my period, but I would say that it's from, you know, the, the, the other universities that are set up in the 19th century are basically to cater to a, to a, a new emerging class of um, a middle classes, basically professional middle classes also, and, and, and especially those who are um, non-conformist, uh, not, uh, not Anglican Catholics, non-conformists. Um, and that's that's the same case with with University College London. In the the, the next wave of modern universities that come in in the twentieth century, um, it's it's also much more a division of class. And as you say, it's about the subjects that are taught there that become the centre of the curriculum are subjects that are seen as utilitarian. But it is a class division rather than any particular concern for immigrants being educated. Mm. So as far as I know. Oh, sorry. Uh, so when we look at, you know, the inclusion of women and the inclusion of women's history, class is a big, big piece of it, you yes. know, um, that this kind of intersection of class and race um, is almost as, almost as important um, as gender. Mm -hmm. And of course, the inclusion of certain women um, speaks loudly to the exclusion of other women, yes. you know. Um, yeah at this point. So it's, it's very, it's a lot to think about. Mm, absolutely. And as you say, I mean, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier, I mean, the, I suppose the, the complexity sometimes leads to people thinking that certain, um, I suppose certain battles have been won and we can move on to other battles as if they were somehow separable and sequential, you know, so, uh, you know, I, people, you know, quite often say, oh, we've, we've, we've dealt with gender now, you know, we don't need to think about, you know, absolutely, that, you know, and it's, it's nonsense, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but there's a sense that you somehow have to deal with one bit, then you move on to the next one. You know? Well, once women come into colleges and are there, um, the public sort of says, okay, women are there, you know, my grandniece or my daughter or, and they, and the university kind of closes up for them. They don't really see the experiences of women within the university. And, um, and that, you know, allows the university in some ways to continue to discriminate against women and women's history because the public has sort of said, well, what's, what's wrong here? There's nothing wrong. Women are there. They're, you know, in the classes, they're teaching the classes, you know, some of them are deans, some of them are, you know, the vice chancellor, etc. Um, and so it's all good. You know, I see the same thing happen about race, you know, oh, well, you know, people of color are there, there are lots of them, what's the problem now, you know, and so it is not only uh, a battle within, but it's also a perception that the public has that um, you know these kinds of issues, the kinds of um, um, oppressions of women or the kinds of marginalization of women and women's history has disappeared because you know, as far as I can tell, they're there is what you know I think the regular, the ordinary taxpayer and also lots of the people who are at the university feel. Mm. Um, I, I think the, the other thing that is 
the case is that um, for, 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 for a period of time, I mean, essentially until you face discrimination, you don't experience yourself as a woman or a person of color. In a sense, you can assimilate without recognizing it because you're not constantly looking at yourself in a mirror as you walk around with other people. You just, you know, you're just in your head. And it's until you you <coughs> you come face to face with something that others you that you recognize it. And so, and and this, and this is something that I think that is you know when i was growing up i wasn't really conscious of feminism as an as an important movement that i needed to be part of um because it was a moment at which i suppose i i just felt assimilated also i grew up in india where you know i didn't really see myself as different <clears throat> i think that i think that's what what's happening now is that suddenly we're coming face to face again with a, with a, with the fact of being women or being something other um and and I think, and I think that that creates, um, you know. So what I'm trying to say is that it's possible for women as well to not feel um, supportive of women's studies. It's possible for you know people who are of a particular, and they don't see it as a problem mm -hmm. until they face something that makes them othered. And I suppose that comes back to where we sort of started in terms of this idea of looking the part, you know, and playing the part and actually thinking about new parts, as it were, and the challenges of that, because there is a, and I suppose the, the Dorothy Sayers metaphor of the, um, uh, the difficulty of, you know, um, wearing nice and distinctive clothes under an academic gown that was designed for a different, you know, person in a different, you know, uh, in a different context. I mean, you know, that notion that for, for women, there's, there are always a few moves you have to go through, aren't there, through, aren't there, through, aren't there, aren't there, I mean, questioning yourself and how you present yourself um, in a way that, you know, for other, I suppose, more, uh, for other groups, it's, 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 you know, that's just much more, um, you know, the, the norm, if you like, um, there's always a, a maneuver that has to take place, perhaps. Um, Yes, I mean, I think that so women, yes, I mean, I think that women, oh, that's okay. Brenda, carry on. Yeah. No, 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 let's move no, on. No, 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 no. Well, I was just going to say that no, I think, no, no, no. I, okay, I, I just think that women, um, if particularly the first women and several generations later in the university did sort of figure out how to fit in, how to fit into a male's world, a male world, mm. you know, um, not to disrupt it too much, to fit in, to prove that you could be here, that you could do the work, that you could withstand the pressure, um, that you could take on the bullying um, that, you know, that we find in, in some male cultures, um, et cetera, and that you wouldn't wilt and you wouldn't cry and run away, um, you know, and all of that. So, uh, so when women's studies was proposed, and even today you find women who just kind of poo-poo it and say, well, we're here, we're equals, you know, all we have to do is what everybody else does and move forward. Um, and I, I still think there's some of that um, that is there, as as Michka says, you know, until it smacks you sort of in the face, you know, then you don't um, you don't realize that it could be a problem, and we see this particularly devastating um, result of that is the way that you know sexual assault on campuses um, have been treated um, and where women sort of fall. Um, women are vulnerable to it, but feel, but, but the whole issue in some ways has been marginalized. It's become a female problem. Um, again, another female problem, what we have to do to protect the girls, you know? Um, and so it's, it's been very, very ugly in some places. And it's been very, um, it's brought up this whole issue of the inequality of women and men on a college campus whether or not they're students or whether or not they are faculty and who's drawn on, who's to try to solve these kinds of problems um, and all of that. Yeah, and in both social terms and intellectual terms, that, that um, 
this disparity means that everyone loses out, don't they? I mean, you know, in a sense, you know, we're all, we started off by, you're saying, Brenda, that, you know, of course, you know, women's history in a sense opens up questions for everybody. It expands the imaginative field, you know, and I think, you know, that's true at all levels, isn't it? Um, yes. Great, we should, we should turn to our, um, thank you so much, we should turn to our um, audience or listeners and um, Wes is going to come in, I think, and... Um, I am indeed. Hello. Um, well, that was really, really interesting discussion. And we have a number of questions. Um, and uh, there may be more once we get the discussion going. Um, I'd like to start with something that Brenda said about the notion that the university is a kind of utopian space in which various kinds of hope and various kinds of new imaginings might occur. But nonetheless, it operates within a very a quite constrained set of social fields, including class, including um, the kind of inherited uh, ideas of gender and so on. And there's a very particular question that's uh, interesting that comes out of the analysis you were you were both giving uh, Brenda and Mishka around the comparison between UK and US um, institutions of education. And somebody else has asked, would uh, you like to say something about community based supplementary schools? and the roles that they might have in the present. In other words, even if we're not necessarily having uh, colleges just for women anymore, let's say in Oxford, or colleges in the US um, just for black students, community-based supplementary schools, um, are they what we need again now? Is that a useful way of thinking about, I mean, it's a question for Jane as well, I guess, in your EDI role for the university. <laughs> how, do we, how do we make, uh, yeah, communities somehow engage with um, the university, the kind of liberal arts, um, and is our community-based schools a useful, supplementary schools, a useful way of doing it, or does that reinforce a kind of separation and so on? And that's a wide open question for anybody, but it's one that came through, so I'll pass it on. Brenda, do you know what, I, maybe we can start with you, do you know what, what, what is meant by community-based supplementary schools? I do no. not, no. <laughs> okay, does anybody on the call know what is meant by that? Uh, okay, I do. So within Oxford, for example, um, uh, through the work of the Humanities Cultural Programme, we've been getting in touch with a whole load of people in Oxford, um, some of whom within the black community in Oxford in particular, have said, right, well, the schools are not no good for us. Mm -hmm. um, or at least uh, our, our black young men in particular, by the time they get into school, um, when they start school, they're great. By the time they leave school, they've been so mm -hmm. fundamentally disrespected by the school system that they've lost their energy to learn. So Saturday schools, for example, are starting up again within Oxford, specifically for black young men. Uh, taught by other black young men, um, it's a kind of, if you like, quasi-separatist, which in my view is a kind of 70s moment, if you like. I mean, that's my my history. Um, but it's clearly something that people think, OK, this is now necessary. Um, and it's a community-based supplementary school outside the existing education system, which is clearly then a challenge to that system to say, mm. you're not doing your job, so we need mm. to do this again. And I mean, I wonder... Mm. Yeah, what people, yeah, go, go, Brenda. Well, you know, so these are schools that take place at Oxford, but they're held on Saturdays. Correct. And they support specific communities of people, people of color, you know, people of various religious backgrounds, etc. Yeah, and um, let's be clear, I, I, Oxford doesn't mean Oxford University. It means people oh. living within Oxford City, organizing oh. for themselves, because mm. precisely the education system, as they understand it, is not serving them well. So you're talking about the public school system, not the university. Correct. Oh, oh yeah. Well, you know, my, my take on it is that, um, you know, any place where you can get additional educational support um, and uh, support of your culture at the same time, it's, I think it's very important. We have a problem like that in the United States. Of course we do. Um, and it's, it's you know, um, it's people of color, particularly, you know, um, we have language, various groups of, of children who go to schools on Saturdays, who go in the evenings. Mm -hmm. We have some of those schools that we hold on campus, um, actually at UCLA, and we're trying to get 
specific communities ready to come to Research One University um, and that kind of thing. And I, I do think it's necessary. I think when you live in a society that um, doesn't see you as being fully integrated or fully part of that society, that it does um, tear at your sense of yourself and your abilities and and all of that. Now, is it should everyone go to them? No. I think that parents and students themselves have to make that kind of decision um, for themselves. Some people feel as if they need them. Some people feel as if they don't. I mean, I think of them as, you know, sending your kid off if your kid's not particularly interested in math. So sending your children off to math um, camp on the Saturdays or something like that. It is a way to, you know, strengthen oneself academically and culturally um, and addresses some of the social needs of students who have because of their identities, social identities, whether it's uh, racial or cultural or or gender or, or sexuality, et cetera, um, who feel marginalized. Um, and so, um, you know, as long as it doesn't take away from their regular learning process um, in the curriculum that's been established for them, that's going to allow them to progress in society and go to college and all of that, I think that's really uh, quite useful. And they have been in the United States. They, mm -hmm. they really have been. Okay. Mishka, yeah. Can I just ask, um, is, are these community schools pathways to universities? Or, or they're not? Are they just sort of separate things? They're just, I mean, in, in a sense, at, its, at their most basic, they are ways of uh, various communities saying, look, the education system as currently constituted is doing a disservice to our children. And we need to supplement it um, specifically with, you know, uh, a specific group of children that are separate from, if you like, the normal. So it, what, it, what it amounts to is a kind of challenge to the, to the, school system but also the university system to say you're not doing your job properly um so we have to supplement it in ways that that are, are yeah different well i think that, that sorry sorry Michigan. sorry i just wanted to say two things in in response to that one is that i think that um i mean i'm sorry i don't know about these it's also because i've only moved to oxford very recently <laughs> but, I, I mean um, they're not specific to oxford but, yeah. um right and but also i didn't grow up in this country so yeah. possibly that didn't that doesn't help but what i did want to say is that i think that i think that that such schools um are, are vital because if, if 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 for no other reason except to 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 show universities what they need to be doing um and I think that this is it, it's something that if, if such schools exist and, and they and they exist in parallel, then it is the job of the university to and 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 the, the standard system to to think about why they are not uh, they're not part of them. Mm -hmm. Why the, why the two aren't so that's that's the, that's my my take on that. The second thing I wanted to say is that this kind of parallel education um, has been has has existed for a long time um, and has been the root of some of the best universities in the world. So, you know, NYU, what used to be called the University of the City of New York, uh, which was founded in 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 the nineteen thirties, um, around the same time as UCL, um, a little bit later, they one of the things one of their main things was that they wanted to offer a curriculum that was different from Columbia's. Mm -hmm. They wanted to offer a curriculum that had more options that were vocational. And they wanted to offer a curriculum that had um, evening classes so that people who were working um, or people who were who had who were adults and had already, you know, were, were a bit older could take courses. Um, and that then grew to be NYU, which is one of the most prestigious universities in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that's the other thing to look at, that that sometimes you know, when you see a need and you, you, you prepare for that need, that can be the basis of, a, of, of something you know, just as good, mm -hmm. an alternative. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's getting the balance. Sorry, it's getting the balance of um, uh, right, isn't it, in terms of people's confidence. I mean, that, that I mean, I think, yes, these, you know, supplementary um, uh, routes to, to, I suppose, ambition and confidence and, and a sense, you know, that, that people can, um, you know, aspire to different, to different things is, is critical, you know, from from the point of view of empowering particular groups. But of course, that can also lead the universities to think, well, actually, it's a it's a problem that's not their problem, and mm -hmm. that people are somehow being prepared on the university's terms to to get access to the university. Whereas, 
you know, we somehow need to shift things the other the other way around, as it were, to think about what we gain from actually different sorts of contribution, which which you know, so there needs to be a dialogue, I think, between these different institutions, you know, so that so that it's not about the it's not about everybody having to change in order to come to the university. It's about yep. us changing. Um, yep. Brenda, did you want to come back on that? Yeah. Yeah, I think that part of the problem is that these students are um, uh, not so much not prepared to come to the university, but feel as if they are not, uh, there's no place for them at the university, yeah. that they're not wanted. Um, you know, having grown up in a society that is very racialized, um, you know, it doesn't really matter that to some people, uh, you know, how talented you are, how well prepared you are, they look at you and they, they don't think you belong. And I've certainly had that experience my entire, uh, my entire career um, and it's going to college and graduate school, etc. cetera. And, um, and so what this does though, I think it's, it, it provides a place of, a, a, a cushioning for you emotionally um, to be at the university to perform at the level that you can um, perform because you've you've already been told and you've been shown that you can actually do that. Now the problem is, as Mishka suggests, is that you know the university needs to build in structures um, that um, alleviates this burden of marginality, and so there needs to be you know uh, some cooperation perhaps between these schools and universities so that they can learn from the process of trying to bring these students who have felt so marginalized into the center again um, of academic life and of learning and of scholarship. And the university needs to be able to continue to um, provide this kind of support for them. I mean, because the university again is um, a microcosm of society. And if indeed, you know, one's race, one culture, one's religion, one's language, et cetera, et cetera, is marginalized in the society, that is, that finds a place on the campus. No matter how smart people are, how, you know, well-educated they are, et cetera, they've been socialized to believe that certain peoples are marginal to them. Um, and so uh, that is something that the university really has to grasp and has to uh, be able to deal with, not only from the perspective of those students who have been marginalized, but of those people who are, who have thought of them as marginal peoples. Thank you. I, somebody's asked, I think, listening very hard to you, Brenda, they've asked, and they've, they've prefaced it very nicely with, I suppose the bold question to ask is, <laughs> are universities themselves actually the problem? In other words, given the history of marginalization is what we need a new sort of institution calling back to Mishka's understanding that actually the university that we have is only 100 years old, let's say, or only just over 100 years old in terms of the, in other words, do we need to kind of a new revolution in terms of what the university is for? Um, uh, or, yeah, is that is that too bold a question? No, I think that the university, as Mishka has said, evolves. You know, and that's one of the magnificent things about young people and young minds and experienced minds working together um, in this kind of, you know, um, utopian idea that the u university provides paths of progress for mm -hmm. society. Okay, so the and the university has evolved. It, it can it needs to continue to do so. I mean, that's why there's now a chair, a Hillary Rodden Clinton chair in women's history at Oxford, and and that's why we have you know the colonial project that Mishka is heading up and all of that. And so the university listens to um, the call for answering social problems, mm -hmm. but um, you know there needs to perhaps be more emphasis on that. And then once you know. So the, as the university continues to change um, in terms of who's at the university and what their interests are, just as with women's history and women, for example, um, we will, you know, it should continue to address social issues. Um, and so I'm hopeful that the university will be a place um, where marginalized people will feel more and more and more included. Um, and um, and therefore, and that would flow back out into society again. I mean, that's really what our mission is, to help mm -hmm. society to progress in all kinds of ways. Mishka, your hand was up. 
Yeah, I just wanted to add to that um, something that I think when, you know, because Jane and Brenda and I have spoken about this before and we've had conversations with each other um, that have been really important for me and I've learned a lot from them. But one of the things that, that came out of it, and, and that's, this is, this is something that I think is, should be core to all of us. Um, the reason why I talked about um, the history of the university is because I think it's really vital that universities are self-reflexive about understanding their own histories. Mm -hmm and where they got here from and why they got here and what they're doing here. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to be conscious of that. And it's important for, I think people who come into university, the young students coming in now to understand, um, you know, that this is not, um, this is not a, a, an eternal now. <laughs> this, there, there, are, there are things that happen to, to get us here. And there are things that might happen to take us away from here. Yeah. Where do we want to go? Um, you know, and, and I think that, that this, this sort of, this question came up for me, in, in a conversation that I was telling Jane and Brenda, and the first conversation we had, where somebody asked me, it was actually a taxi driver in Cambridge, and he said to me, what's the point of history? What's the point of your doing history? We never learn anything from it. Um, he was very bitter. Um, and, and, I, and I started, and I really started thinking about it. Um, why, what is the point of doing history? And I think that for me, and I think people have to answer their own, historians have to answer their, their own question. But for me, it's, it's, History is not about understanding the past so we don't repeat it. History is about understanding what our relationship with the past is right now, right here, and what that means for how we look at ourselves and now and each other. Um, and I think that that's true, whether, you know, in the, in the case of the university as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jane, you had your hand up as well. And then I've got one yeah, more I question. Almost want I almost want to leave leave that as the, as the last <laughs> word, but, but no, I was just going to say that there's so much en positive energy in a sense that does come from particularly our, our students. I mean, I remember when the issue of fees and the increase in student fees was raised, um, yep. a lot of students um, worked with people in the community of Oxford, I mean, to set up free spaces in which discussion took place. I mean, you know, we all got involved as well, but, but mm -hmm. it was the initiative, the energy came from students who wanted to make that conversational connection and little did they know in many cases I mean that actually to some extent that was picking up on a on a dynamic that was there in the late 19th century as well where you know people who were interested in what was called university extension and who were interested in again trying to connect up with the local community and that then gets lost I mean it, again these are not straight lines so I think you know there, there are energies that we can point back to. Yeah. Absolutely. And in, in fact, I think if I may add just something to myself to this debate, it seems to me that one of the things I think Mishka's absolutely right, we don't just have to look to learn history to know what not to do. We can also look to history to see what people have done in the past and then they got lost. You know, it's, mm. it's very crudely the paths not taken or the kind of counterfactual history, um, which connects up with the utopian strain that Brenda's been talking about, mm. which the universities can be kind of carriers of and and um, Sort of can take forward in a way that that um, is slightly dissenting to to the way in which things might otherwise be developing. But to remember, mm. yeah, there was a moment when the other things were possible. Let's let's mm. recapture that energy um, at some point. Um, and I think um, that's uh, that's clearly one of the things that this series um, is going to be about. Um, I don't know, Jane, if you'd like to sort of wrap up the conversation today. We're nearly ten past uh, already, so. Um, uh, the last question has come through and you've already been asked it. Um, <laughs> I mean, th th there was one more question just about how, how institutions change and about how things like canons change. But, it, it uh, um, you know, Dorothy L. Say, as you mentioned, Emily Dickinson wasn't honoured at the beginning, but it's now clearly understood to be a great poet. Um, mm. But I suspect that these, this is a question that will come back again and again over Absolutely. the course of the conversations uh, as we go. Yeah. Um, I'll get out of the way, Jane, and, and leave you to, to wrap up for today. No, I mean, I, I just wanted to say, I suppose, what an interesting conversation it's been and how um, uh, grateful I am to Brenda and Mishka and, and to you, Wes, for, for being involved in it and to all the people who are, who are out there listening and contributing. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's really important that institutions are self-reflexive, that we don't um, you know, take things for granted. And, and I think, as I say, coming back to this, this idea of um, uh, playing a part, if you like, which we all do in all, all aspects of our life. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that, that we need to um, think of ways of affirming um, people playing different parts, I suppose, and creating different parts. Um, and, and as I say, that seems to me 
something that you know universities are potentially good at and potentially need to but to but always need to re re-articulate I suppose um and and that you know we will all benefit from that so that's how I'd like to end I think probably thank you well then um all it leads me to say is again thank you to all three of you for um coming into our big tent as we call it <laughs> um and uh to invite everybody else to come back for the next conversation um uh i can't quite remember when that is but it's on the website in a month's, month's time yeah absolutely. in a month's time thank you um it's on um do have a look um and um thank you all for coming uh out there in the wider world too um we'll sign off for now and hope to see you again soon thank you thank you Goodbye. so much thank you Okay.